This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In the 1920s, Edgar Cayce gained widespread notoriety for his apparent ability to make complex medical diagnoses while in a self-induced trance. Even now, 45 years after Cayce's death, thousands claim to have benefited and been cured by his knowledge. Some say it is merely a combination of luck and the power of suggestion. 28-year-old Crystal Spencer was a small town girl determined to make it big in the movies. But for Crystal, the road to stardom led through Hollywood's seamy underside, and sadly, a confusing and mysterious death. According to her family and friends, Crystal was murdered. Easter Sunday, 1990, just outside Coldwater, Michigan, Ray and Marie Thornton were enjoying their weekly drive through the country. Quite by accident, this quiet Sunday outing would place the Thorntons at the center of an unsolved mystery. These intriguing stories all need one final clue, one final piece of information before they can be solved. Perhaps someone watching tonight can help. Perhaps it's you. Kathy, you have a condition called optic neuritis. Uh, this is a condition where the optic nerve... In 1986, 27-year-old Kathy Kimura visited her ophthalmologist. Okay, you can sit back now, Kathy. Kathy thought she had a minor problem, but the doctor's verdict was horrifying. Your vision is a poor... Kathy might be going blind. It may uh, return, it may not return. So it was a very frightening experience. Now, he said I wouldn't run out right and away and, and buy a white again, cane, but it's very serious, and, and I was scared. I mean, I suddenly realized that there was a possibility that I could go blind. I never, I hadn't taken it seriously all along. Kathy's trouble had begun one week earlier. I woke up one morning and I just saw that uh, there was a little area in my field of vision that I couldn't see out of. And I just thought there was a speck on my um, eye and that um, I, I tried to rub it away and nothing happened. It, it didn't leave. I didn't really think too much about it. I just thought it was unusual. Um, and I just let it go. And throughout the day, it didn't disappear. And the next day, it was a little larger area. By the end of the week, when I couldn't see it all out of the eye, I decided this probably isn't normal and I probably should do something about it. Kathy consulted two other ophthalmologists. The diagnosis was unanimous, optic neuritis. Possible consequence, blindness. There is no known cure. Her doctor recommended steroids. Kathy was strongly opposed to the use of steroids and was determined to find an alternative. She consulted a doctor who was well-versed in the mysterious methods of a man named Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey became famous in the 1920s as a diagnostician, even though he had absolutely no medical training. In his lifetime, Casey made more than 9,000 diagnoses, which he called readings, while in a deep, self-induced trance. In 1937, Casey did a reading on this 18-year-old woman who suffered from scleroderma, a disfiguring chronic disease with no cure in which a person's skin hardens. Casey prescribed a number of treatments and her scleroderma went into immediate remission. The reading was given in January and the, and the readings were followed to the letter. In an interview and, 40 uh, years later, the woman gave Edgar Casey full credit for her cure. In June, of 1930.
In 1976, six-year-old Andrew Senzon suffered from severe psoriasis. In desperation, Andrew's mother sought out a doctor who utilized methods set down by Edgar Cayce 30 years earlier. Within four months, the psoriasis was gone. Today, Andrew Senzon is 21 years old and has had only one recurrence, which also responded to the Casey treatments. Some people write off Edgar Casey's cures as lucky coincidence or the power of suggestion acting on psychosomatic illness. But for those diagnosed with a disease that modern medicine cannot cure, or in some cases even explain, Edgar Casey's methods continue to hold out hope. Casey died in 1945. Even so, each year thousands of inquiries from all over the world pour into Casey's nonprofit center in Virginia Beach, Virginia. The thriving center is an unlikely legacy for Edgar Casey, a quiet, unpretentious man who came of age in rural Kentucky at the turn of the century. My father was a very ordinary person. He liked to garden, he liked to fish. We had gardens wherever we lived. He taught Sunday school. I mean, in everyday life, uh, you wouldn't know him from anybody else. It was only when he was asleep that he had extraordinary ability. Edgar Casey discovered his mysterious ability when he was 13. Time for your lessons, young man. A borderline student, Edgar fell asleep over his spelling book. Cabin. When his father quizzed him, Edgar could spell every word in the book and even knew the page numbers where each word appeared. Cattle. From that time on, all he had to do was sleep on his books at night, and uh, he moved along very rapidly, whether it was spelling or math or history or whatever, and he became an exceptional student rather than an average student. In 1900, when Edgar was 23, he suddenly lost the power of speech. For an entire year, physicians were unable to explain or cure his illness. Continue to breathe deeply. As a last resort, Casey's parents convinced him to see a hypnotist. His family physician attended and recorded the session in minute detail. Casey sank into a deep sleep. Everyone present was stunned when for the first time in a year, Edgar Casey spoke. Yes, we have the body before us. Dad never had any formal medical training. In fact, uh, his uh, educational career stopped to be equivalent to the ninth grade now. Due to a paralysis of the interior muscles of the vocal cords. He would uh, suggest things and describe things, the parts of the body that he had no knowledge of. This will remove the trouble. He started to, to talk speech. and say, yes, we have the condition of the constriction to the throat, uh, some uh, constriction of the blood the flow, so we will correct it. The body will now awaken. And when uh, Lane, the hypnotist, told him to wake up, he sat up and coughed up a little blood, and he could talk. Are you all right? And I think that was probably the first reading, though it was on himself. Hello. <laughs> Casey's doctor persuaded him to attempt diagnoses on other patients who had not responded to traditional medicine. Casey agreed, but the end result left him disillusioned. The problem developed when, at the end of some of the readings, people would start asking him questions about who was going to, what horse was going to win a race, uh, what was going to happen in the commodities, the stock market, uh, uh, the results of a ball game. And when he found out what had happened or what people were doing, he said, I'm giving it up. Casey abandoned his psychic readings, married, and moved to Selma, Alabama, where he worked as a photographer. By 1914, he had two sons, Edgar Evans and Hugh Lynn. When Hugh Lynn was eight years old, he was terribly injured in a darkroom explosion. The local doctor held out little hope. How is he, doctor? I've managed to remove most of the powder from his eyes. But I found that the damage to the tissue is so extensive that he may lose his sight. My brother was playing in a, in a studio and dropped a match in a 
partially filled can of flashlight powder and it blew up in his face and burned his eyes very badly. The doctors examined him and said, well, we think we're going to have to take out one eye. He's probably going to lose the sight in both of them. And uh, my brother said, Daddy, give me a reading. Let's go into the parlor. For Edgar Casey, it was the ultimate test. He had not attempted a reading in years. Could he now save his own son from a life of blindness? Although tannic acid would not be normally used under these circumstances, he described for a child. Uh, an application for the case, eyes that included tannic acid. Be well, that was unheard of at the time, the and the doctors thought it was too strong, but they thought he was going to lose his eyes anyway, so they wouldn't hurt to try it. And when they first put it on, well, you then said, this uh, must be daddy's medicine. It doesn't hurt. It seemed like a miracle. Within six weeks, Hugh Lynn's sight was completely restored. Word of the boy's recovery spread. Edgar Casey soon became famous. In 1925, he moved to Virginia Beach, Virginia. Within five years, Casey established a center there to catalog and interpret the readings. The center received thousands of letters, most of them requests for readings. Although Casey normally did only two readings a day, he was unable to turn his back on those who seemed to need him so desperately. He felt like he couldn't refuse people, so he started doing two and three and four and five, and he got up to, I understand, nine or ten a day, and it was just too much for him. On the brink of exhaustion, Edgar Casey suffered a massive stroke. He died on January 3rd, 1945, leaving behind more than 120,000 pages of readings, which continue to serve as a wellspring of hope for those in search of cures that may have eluded established medicine. Now, Kathy, an x-ray examination of your neck shows that you have the deviation... When Kathy Kimura's optic neuritis was diagnosed in 1986, she went to Dr. John Pagano, a chiropractor in New Jersey who has studied Edgar Casey's readings for 30 years. Casey was very specific on what well, areas really of the be. spine to adjust. Loosen up these vertebrae. The so fact that, the that uh, Casey the suggested is complete this certain procedure for eye problems does not mean that he specifically diagnosed it as optic neuritis. He talked about vision problems, blindness, and that's what I approached that, not as optic neuritis. First, I'm going to stretch you out a little bit to sort of get the blood circulating. After I gave her an adjustment, she good. called me the next day to tell me there's an improvement. We continued treatment. And, and within seven days, her sight was restored. That's the idea. Dr. Pagano Wilson. believes that Edgar Casey's treatments, okay. set forth in several That's readings that. given decades earlier, brought back Kathy Kamora's vision. Skeptics disagree. I think much of the Casey material is based upon illusion. And I think there's a placebo effect here at work. Often, if you believe that uh, someone is going to cure you, you give them white sugar pills, they might be cured. So the power of the mind can have a powerful effect. I do believe in the power of the mind. And um, I tried to will the sight back before I had gone to Dr. Bugano, and um, it didn't work. And it was only after I had gone to Dr. Bugano and after he had adjusted my neck that, um, that the sight came back. I don't think that Edgar Casey had any psychic powers. I don't think there's such a thing as psychic medicine. And I, don't, I, I think we, one ought to be very cautious about the claim that you can diagnose illnesses in some mystical way. How can the unique life of Edgar Casey be explained? He has been denounced as a soothsayer. He has been heralded as a prophet. The medical establishment refuses to endorse Casey's methods, yet at the same time is unwilling to dismiss them. Before his death, Edgar Casey wrote to a friend. In my life and in the lives of many who have come in contact with the readings, there seems to be much that is of help. But you must judge for yourself. Facts and results are the only measuring rods. If this knowledge is to be of any lasting benefit, it will require open-minded, intelligent research. Perhaps the readings of Edgar Casey are one mystery that will be solved only through patience, medical evaluation, and that greatest of all healers, 
time. Next, an aspiring actress is found dead in her Los Angeles apartment. The coroner ruled her death due to undetermined causes, but some say it was murder. Hollywood, California, the dream factory, a fantasy land of myth and legend fueled by the tantalizing fable that anyone can become famous overnight. Ever since the movies began, beautiful young girls have flocked to Hollywood, lured by the glamour of Tinseltown and the promise of stardom. It was this dream which brought 23-year-old Crystal Spencer to Los Angeles in the summer of 1982. For as long as she could remember, Crystal Spencer pictured herself as not just an actress, but a star. Sadly, her search for fame and fortune led only to frustration, failure, and some say murder. Crystal Lene Spencer was raised in the small northern California town of Ukiah. When she was eight, her father died, leaving her mother to raise three small children alone. At 17, Crystal dropped out of high school and took a job to help support the family. Soon Hollywood beckoned, and she moved to the Los Angeles area to actively pursue her dream. Her early years were a struggle, resulting only in a few bit parts. Crystal quickly realized that true stardom was elusive and perhaps unobtainable. Within two years of her arrival, Crystal reluctantly took a job as an exotic dancer to pay her bills. On a good night, she cleared up to $400 in tips, but Crystal never fully accepted the fact that in essence, she was a stripper. Sometimes she would just like start crying. Like she felt degraded about herself, of what she'd done. In May of 1987, friends invited Crystal to an outdoor barbecue. She was eager to mix and mingle with people who might help further her acting career. Hi, man, Tom. Nice to meet you. It's nice meeting you. Oh, this is your place, then. This is your home. There was something very alluring and compelling about Crystal that would readily catch your eye. She knew that she would become not only an actress, but she would become a very famous actress. And it was just a matter of time. Crystal was taken with Anton Klein, a would-be screenwriter and a PhD candidate in history. Though they came from totally different backgrounds, they soon fell in love. Anton took it upon himself to help Crystal broaden her horizons. He introduced her to art galleries, museums, and concerts. Crystal was dazzled. She loved classical music. She loved uh, fine art. She wanted to know more about these other wonderful things of life that she had never been exposed to before. Anton had no idea how Crystal earned her living. She walked a precarious tightrope, discovering art and culture by day, immersed in Hollywood's dark side by night. Crystal loved Anton very much. She was very scared about him finding out. And uh, she says, well, I better change. I better quit dancing then before he finds out. I better quit doing this before he finds out. I want to get married. I want to have a future. I want to start, you know, doing something for my life. Finally, four months after they met, Anton found out about Crystal's other life. A neighbor saw her dancing at the club by the airport where she worked. And uh, he said, I saw that girl on stage the other night. And I said, no, you, you couldn't have. He said, that was her. Of course it was her. And I was shocked. He was very upset, but he said it was OK. He accepted it, which shocked her. And it, she didn't know what to say. On Wednesday, May 4th, 1988, Crystal was home with a cold. Anton stopped by and they talked about a promising offer she had received to work in the Orient. 
So what's happened with Japan? <coughs> I don't know. Um, they haven't called yet. When are you leaving? I'm not even sure if I have the job or not. Yet. She was very nervous, but excited about the possibility of traveling to Japan and seeing a whole different world than what she was accustomed to. I spoke to Crystal Hello. Thursday evening, the next evening, on All the right. telephone. How you doing? You feeling better? Much better, thanks. That's good. And the conversation You're lasted about 15 minutes. I said, I'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay. And I hung cool. up the phone. And that was the last time I ever spoke of her. Three days later, Anton tried to reach Crystal, but continuously got a busy signal. An operator told him the receiver was off the hook. Yeah, I'm looking for Crystal Spencer. She's not working tonight. Did she work here last night? She didn't punch in. Confused, Anton assumed that Crystal had left for Japan without saying goodbye. Excuse me. Have you seen Crystal Spencer? What? Have you seen Crystal Spencer? No, I haven't seen her in a couple of days. What? Do you know where she is? I, I was expecting any day to receive a very excited phone call from a very excited Crystal saying, it's wonderful here. It's a whole different world here. And instead, I got a phone call from the Burbank Police Department. Friday, the 13th of May, 1988. Police discovered the decomposed body of Crystal Spencer. She had been dead for nearly a week. They at first just said she was found dead in her apartment. And they wanted to know when I'd last seen her. And I said, I last saw her on Wednesday. And how was she? I said, well, she had a cold. And uh, they said they believed she died of natural causes. An autopsy revealed no trace of drugs or alcohol in Crystal's system. There were no obvious signs of foul play or suicide. The coroner ruled that her death was the result of undetermined causes. The body of Miss Spencer was in such an advanced state of decomposition, they were not able to ascribe the cause of death, uh, so they have no finding. I was suspicious because I did not believe that Crystal Spencer died of illness. She was not a sick woman. When I last saw her or I last spoke with her, she was a young woman with a cold. I was suspicious because the way I was told the body was found in an obscure corner of her apartment, nude from the waist down, the phone went off the hook for days, and I became extremely suspicious when I learned that neighbors had heard terrible screams and shrills coming from her apartment that some had described as the sounds of torture. On the night of May 7th, two of Crystal's neighbors had been awakened by a strange intermittent wailing. Two, three minutes after four, I remember looking at the clock, and I heard some moans and some just funny sounds. You know how you are when you wake up. You just don't know what's going on. Somebody's screaming. But even before I even woke him up, I laid there thinking someone's being tortured, someone's being hurt, something's going on. You know, I had no past prior experience to what the sounds were, because they were so blood-curdling eerie that they frightened me very much. Sounds terrible, do you, think it's, do you think it's coming from here? All I could think about for some upstairs? reason was someone taking a cigarette and putting it against her body, torturing her. Because we had heard, like, choking and moaning. But then when this started, that's all we heard. Well, why don't we, why don't Susan was very police? adamant about calling the police, call the but police. out of my fear of what I heard, I didn't want to get involved. That was my first reaction. I don't think I'll ever be able to live with the fact that I didn't call the police. If I had, maybe she would still be alive. A week later, Crystal's body was discovered, and the Taylors finally told their story to the you police. Any witnesses you saw or heard something? We could go back four in the he just took my statement, took my name, asked me for my driver's license. And that was it. It, it was just very nonchalant about it. 
I believe most sincerely, as does her family, that Crystal Lene Spencer was murdered in the early morning hours of May 7th, 1988. Crystal's family requested to view the body several times. The coroner's office continually refused, claiming the body was in no condition to be seen. For months, Anton Klein was denied access to the police records. However, in September of 1988, he was able to obtain the autopsy report. Anton was shocked by the discrepancies he found. Crystal Spencer was barely five foot tall. The autopsy report claims that she's an amazing five foot seven. Crystal Spencer weighed approximately 105 pounds when I last saw her. The autopsy claims the body is a well-nourished 140 pounds. I, I was stunned. I said, this is not the body of Crystal Spencer. And where is the real body of Crystal Spencer? You don't, you don't grow seven inches and gain 50 to 60 pounds when you're dead. The only thing that comes to my mind is a possible documentary error at the coroner's office. Uh, they are overwhelmed with work. However, we do have the remains identified by fingerprints from two different agencies, as I mentioned before. And those really eliminate any possibility of the uh, coroner's uh, autopsying the wrong remains. Uh, I was told by one law enforcement official, quote unquote, bad things happen to bad girls. And I said, you mean bad girls die of natural causes? And he said, you know what I mean, and hung up on me on the phone. Two weeks after the discovery of her body, Crystal's family and friends gathered for a private memorial service. Fittingly, Crystal Spencer's ashes were scattered beneath the famous Hollywood sign. I believe the investigation was bungled. And I am angered that they are attempting now to suppress the police reports in this case forever. We need to know what happened to her. It's important to all of us who cared about her to learn the truth. That's all we want is the truth. Next, police need your help to find a man suspected in the brutal murder of his ex-wife. Easter Sunday, 1990. A lonely road, 12 miles outside of Coldwater, Michigan. Ray and Marie Thornton set off on a leisurely drive in the country, as they did every weekend. I don't like the style. But in just a matter of minutes, the routine Sunday outing would place this ordinary, law-abiding couple at the center of a strange and ominous mystery. We were driving south on Snow Perry Road, and uh, all of a sudden, a van just on us and passed. Look at this guy coming around us, honey. He sure is in a hurry. There he goes. Jeez. Jeez. He must be in a hurry. One of the things we do when we're out driving around is we make names out of license plates. And uh, Marie came up with the G's. He's, he's really in a hurry, because the first two letters of his license plate were G-Z. And it was just spontaneous, really no thought behind it. Several miles down the road, the Thorntons came across the man and the van a second time. As we approached an old schoolhouse, I saw a man behind it and he had what appeared to be a bloody sheet. As we continued passing the school, I saw the van parked between the building and a big tank. There's the van that passed us. Where? It's right there. There was the one that passed us? Yes, I'm sure it was. It was the van that passed us. Minutes later, the van pulled up behind them again and rode their bumper for nearly two miles. I'm going to start writing this stuff down. Our game really paid off because that helped me remember the first two letters of his license plate number. 
but we wanted to get more if possible. Well, he's got a white skull cap on right now, like mine. Finally, a nervous Ray Thornton turned off the highway. When he did, the van pulled to the side of the road. We decided to turn around and come back and uh, see if we get a license plate number. We felt if we could get the license number, then we could turn into the police. The guy was acting very suspicious, and uh, we just felt that authorities should be notified. There he is. What is he doing? I don't know. He's in the back of the van. He looks like he's changing. He is. He's changing plates. He was behind his van with uh, the passenger around. front door open. Seen the numbers on that plate just and I saw that the passenger door was covered with blood. There's blood all over that door. What door? The passenger door. That guy has done something. He has. The Thorntons feared that something unspeakable had happened. They returned to the schoolyard to search for the sheet. Well, I was beginning to get nervous when we got back to the schoolhouse. Uh, we were very careful about where we walked. Okay. We tried to find what this white thing was that he had been carrying. Look, look. I see it. That's probably it. What is it? Oh, that's awesome. Partially stuffed into a small animal hole was a blood soaked blanket. It's definitely blood, all right. Let's go call it, please. On an otherwise pleasant spring afternoon, Ray and Marie Thornton had chanced upon evidence of a shocking crime, a crime which marked the complete and tragic disintegration of a family. Unwittingly, the Thorntons were witness to the final chapter of a bitter, heated conflict between a husband and his wife, which ended in murder. Yeah, it's He's a man in the open. He's <laughs> To outward appearances, Dennis and Marilyn Depew of Coldwater, Michigan, had a comfortable middle-class life. Now you be both had gratifying careers. Dennis was a state of Michigan property assessor, Marilyn a high school counselor. Together they were raising three healthy children. But beneath the surface, smoldering tensions threatened to erupt at any moment. After the children were born, Dennis grew sullen and withdrawn. He began to isolate himself from the family and accuse Marilyn of turning the children against him. It's not that they, you know, fought all the time because they didn't. It was just, you know, they just didn't really talk. She would just say in general that she was unhappy. And when, when the lawyer or someone else would ask her why she wanted to get a divorce, she would say because the marriage is broken up and because uh, she was, there was no longer a marriage there. You want to make sure that you want to go through with it this time. And if you do, you got to sign it on this page and sign it on the last page. In 1989, after 18 years of marriage, Marilyn Depew finally gave up. Thank you. Now, do you have any questions at all, Marilyn? What about him seeing the children, then? We'll have to wait till the hearing a week from Friday. Marilyn wanted to be more of her own person, so raising her family as she saw fit. I believe that she felt at that time that Dennis was, in effect, trying to domineer her, that is, run her life and not allow her to make decisions that she wanted to make. He was agreeable to his wife having custody. As far as property was concerned, he was very willing to allow his wife to have almost most of the property that she wanted. Uh, many times I had to uh, fight with him to, uh, you know, get a fair share of the property, but he was very willing to give her uh, whatever she wanted. I don't. I don't want this thing to happen. At all. I don't want this divorce. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not something I want or want to deal with. And um, despite Dennis's to attempts to keep the marriage intact, the divorce became final in December of 1989. Dennis was granted biweekly visitation rights but the children were often reluctant to spend time with him. Dennis was also granted access to the guest house, which he used as an office, and as an excuse to maintain control over his family. Marilyn had to change all the locks on the doors. 
even after she changed the locks on the doors, she would tell me that there were some times when she would come home and unlock the house and go in, and there was Dennis sitting on the couch. She didn't know how he got in because she had different keys made and new locks and everything, and she seemed a little frightened about that. He sort of out of the blue just indicated to me one day uh, that uh, he was contemplating suicide and, and murder. Easter Sunday, April 15th, 1990. Dennis arrived to pick up two of the children for a visit. His younger daughter, Julie, had already refused to go with him. Come on, Scott, get your things. Put the game well, down. Let's go. Well, get can your I jacket. Go a little later? No, I can't. Look, I came here now. You're going now. I'm not hanging around here anymore. But Julie doesn't have to I go. I don't care what Julie says. Come on. Yeah, now no, stop. Just calm no, down. No, look, every time you turn him on. He's you know, old enough to make his own decisions. Don't you understand? He's yes, coming with you. Leave him alone. You're making things terrible. I hate you. You want him out of my life. Stop it. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. The DePew's eldest daughter, Jennifer, ran to a neighbor's house to call the sheriff's office. She wasn't walking completely on home. We're going to the hospital. He was, like, holding her up. We're going to the hospital. You kids stay here. And when they were walking by, um, you know, I just, like, you know, said, Mom, Mom, you know, and she, she didn't even look at me. She was just, like, kind of, like, in a daze. The DePews never arrived at the hospital. Sheriff's deputies and the Michigan State Police immediately began a search for the missing couple. That same afternoon, Ray and Marie Thornton found a bloodied blanket in the schoolyard. The area was quickly cordoned off. The authorities began to assume the worst. Marilyn Depew was probably dead. How's it look, guys? Deputies discovered several fresh tire tracks and a large pool of blood. Good reproduction here. The tracks were later matched to Dennis's van. Great. The blood was Marilyn's. All right. What time did you get off here? The next day, a highway worker discovered Marilyn DePew's body just off a deserted road, midway between the schoolhouse and her home. She had been shot once in the back of the head. We had a feeling that he had really done something terrible. It was so brutal and premeditated that it makes you so angry. If she had been killed in an automobile accident, you could get over that, but not this. Just days after the murder, Dennis sent a series of wild, rambling letters to friends and relatives in which he tried to justify Marilyn's death. To co-worker Jan Markowski, Dennis wrote, Marilyn had many, many opportunities to treat me fairly during this divorce and she chose to string it out, trick me, lie to me. And when you lose your wife, children, and home, there's not much left. I was too old to start over. Altogether, Dennis sent a total of 17 letters, postmarked in Virginia, Iowa, and Oklahoma. It seemed as if Dennis was trying to say that those of us who were friends of Marilyn, were the ones who caused her death. When in effect, it was Dennis who pulled the trigger. None of the rest of us did that. The only closure that we could get out of it would be to have Dennis caught. That's the only thing. I can't uh, think of anything else that would help me 
I think of it day and night, and I will the rest of my life. And nothing, even Dennis being caught, will not take this terrible feeling away and loss. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a lie for a lie, a life for a life. Three months after the murder, Dennis Depew sent copies of his 13-page letter to a number of friends and relatives. It reads like a treatise, a chilling 5,000-word rationalization which takes liberally from the Bible throughout. I realize that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but sometimes the Lord is too busy doing other things. Dennis Depew is six feet tall and weighs 200 pounds. He has dark brown hair and dark, deep-set eyes. He was last seen driving a 1984 cream-colored Chevrolet van with maroon stripes, which may now bear Illinois license plates. At around 8.30 on the night of our broadcast, a woman who asked that we call her Mary arrived at her home outside Dallas, Texas, Mary's boyfriend, Hank Queen, was already home. His uh, van was parked in the driveway, which was um, out of the ordinary because he usually kept it uh, inside the garage. Hi. Hi, it's good you got that. He told me that his mother was very ill and that he needed to make an emergency trip home. And I'm going to drive up here. Could you make me some sandwiches that I can take on there? It's a really long drive. I was sure that something else must really be going on, but I didn't know what. Maybe three or four sandwiches and his ex He was uh, uh, getting clothes out of the closet, uh, clothes out of some drawers, gathering up some of his personal items. At the same time, giving me instructions on uh, preparing some food for him to take on the long trip. What do you want to drink? I don't care anything. Um, soda? Cans of soda would be good. Aren't you going to give me a hug? He uh, just gave me a little uh, peck of a kiss, and I gave him a big hug and said goodbye to him. I realized that something was troubling him, and I knew I would never see him again. Later that night, Mary was shocked to learn that her boyfriend, Hank Queen, was really Dennis Depew, and that he had just been featured on Unsolved Mysteries. For nearly a year, Dennis DePew's whereabouts remained a mystery until the night of our broadcast. Looking back on it now, I'm sure he was watching. And uh, I think that he was deliberately keeping uh, my uh, attention distracted in the kitchen so that I wouldn't see the segment and so that he could leave. A friend of Mary's called our telecenter and provided authorities with a Texas license plate number of Dennis DePew's van. Four hours later, DePew's life came to a violent end, just across the Louisiana-Mississippi state border. When Louisiana state troopers spotted DePew's van, they attempted to pull him over. He led police on a 15-mile high-speed chase and broke through two police barricades. I told the deputies if uh, the van refused to stop to shoot a tire off over the front tire. And they missed the front tire, but they got both back ones. He traveled about uh, half a mile and just wouldn't go any further, and he stopped. After firing two shots through his windshield at deputies and another through an open window, DePew turned his gun on himself and took his own life. Uh, it, was, it was a funny feeling to, to realize that uh, the night before that you had been watching this man, that he was wanted uh, for murder someplace, and then uh, you walk up to the van and you recognize him as being the person that was on Unsolved Mysteries. It, it's a funny feeling. But I think he intended to die whether he had to do it by his own hands or where he could get us to kill him. Otherwise, uh, he would have stopped and we'd have gotten him out of the van alive and there never been any shots fired. 
While living as a fugitive, Dennis DePew sent a chilling letter to several friends trying to justify his ex-wife's death. He wrote, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a lie for a lie, a life for a life. At the time, Dennis DePew had no idea just how prophetic those words would be. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who holds a final piece of the puzzle. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.